Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could teach the gullible To never be so comfortable with eyes they eat like comfort food To disregard the bogus claims and pseudo-scientific claims Can you imagine just how much indeed the world would change? No more political predators playing on the populace With ilka supplies, the ship and kill metropolis No more villains with the title in the Bible Holding phony tip providers like the stuff they teach is vital Imagine it was normal to have to prove a claim you made And folks really feel ashamed to express some content that was fake It's not to say we never make mistakes It's just to say we go out of our way to show the evidence it takes Remain skeptical while you travel the world or even stay trapped We're allowed to get fast, that's what it is, yo Keep yeah. reality intact to help the truth And especially the ones you believe in Remain skeptical while you travel the world to reason Welcome to Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century. I am David Tamayo, president and founder of Hispanic American Freethinkers. And today I have the honor, the pleasure, and uh, well, hopefully I learned something new to have as uh, co-host, uh, Mr. Larry Mendoza. What do you have to say for yourself? Oh, no, the pleasure's all mine, David. I'm glad, glad to be here. We have an exciting show for you guys today, so well, have fun. Well, today we have Dr. Thomas Doyle. He's a whistleblower and a steadfast, a steadfast witness. Uh, for victims of sexual uh, of clerical sexual abuse and so uh, we're gonna do some announcements first and uh, maybe some news and discussion for you know a few minutes and then we'll get right to it and uh, drill him like he's never been drilled before about the <laughs> toughest questions we'll walk out of here having all the solutions in the world that's so, right uh, dr. Doyle welcome uh, thank you for joining us here today my pleasure thank you all right, so why don't we start with uh, some announcements. I'll, I'll do the first one. Sure, if, go ahead. Uh, so Hispanic American Freethinkers meets once a month, and I highly recommend that you come by Tyson's Corner in Virginia. There are different meetings in other parts of the uh, country. If you're in, if you're in Orlando, uh, they have meetings there also. So I uh, highly recommend that you come by. It's a lot of good food, good fun. Uh, you know, you really have to just uh, enjoy yourself and talk about anything you want. So I welcome you there. Uh, I'll be there, and it's going to be this Friday at 7 p.m. in Tyson's Corner at the Olive Garden. Uh, you don't have to buy anything you don't you just have to be there and be charming and that's about it uh, everybody uh, basically pays for their own consumption whatever they want and that's it so hopefully we'll see you there wonderful just want to make a couple of uh, quick announcements about uh, our next week's shows and the show following that one so next week uh, join us with host Rob Penzak who is now the uh, executive director for uh, Atheist Alliance of America. He will be co-hosting a show with Tiffany Harding and their guest will be Aaron Ra, who is the president of uh, Atheist Alliance of America. So that should no, be a good no, show. No one really knows who Aaron Ra is. Yeah, I don't think anybody knows who he is, right? <laughs> Except for the uh, thousands and thousands of followers he's got. Yeah, and he has a lot of followers. So that should be a really fun show. Uh, in the following week, I will be hosting again with Kay Terzak and we are going to have uh, Sarah Paquette uh, on the show. She is uh, the, was one of the driving forces behind building the uh, Peter Boghossian app uh, Atheos, which is an app that teaches you how to uh, perform and be able to do street epistemology. And if you, if you haven't so, downloaded it, I highly recommend yes. it. It's really, really good. It's a fantastic and app. It's a great teaching tool. I'm glad that uh, yep. they spent a lot of time on it. Yeah, I was uh, part of uh, helping them out with some of the beta testing and gave, gave some advice on it. So it's a very good, it's a very good app. It's really fun. Yeah. So teaches you how to have a conversation without being too um too forceful, uh, too forceful or without yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, people pushing back. Anyway, right. uh, so any other announcements? I think that covers it for now. Let's uh, okay. go ahead and talk about some news. So. Well, so I have one piece of news that is kind of interesting. Most of you know that uh, uh, in these past elections, we had this fake news that were taking over, and a, a lot of people said that things shifted the way they did because of this fake news in Facebook especially and in other places, but mostly in Facebook, where basically there were uh, Russians, there were all, all kinds of people just creating fake news, putting them on and, and believing them. Yeah. So uh, uh, the founder of, uh, of uh, Facebook, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, mm -hmm. he came out and said, well, we're going to fix that. We're going to eliminate the fake news uh, that right. comes out. We're not going to permit it. And so who do you think was against this? move well besides the people making fake news fake news <laughs> well the religions religious religious organizations came out against that because they said well wait a minute now we're gonna have to prove that 
miracles are real and we're going to have to, and, you know, those are secular truths right. that, you know, we shouldn't accept. So they're now asking for that little thing they always ask for, special privilege. Right. They want to be exempted from these rules. So as a religion, they can say anything they want and no one has to prove them right or wrong. So, uh, you know, this and is... It's, it's, it's part of the same cycle with these people. It's uh, about... It's not, they call it, it's under the guise of religious freedom. But what really is, is a, a Christian special privilege in this country. And that's basically what it is. And, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, here in public, I'll bet you a dollar mm -hmm. that they will get away with it. Probably. <laughs> so, get away with everything so, else. Uh, is that, you know, asking for a special privilege. I mean, we already have uh, laws that are passed. I mean, I, I went to buy a, a bottle of wine recently on a Sunday here in Virginia. Nope, can't do it. Why? Because some time ago, religious leaders said, no, 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 we want you to come to church and you can't buy anyone on, on, on Sunday. <laughs> so ridiculous. Anyway, yeah. I think that uh, if you have an opportunity, uh, talk about this and uh, talk it with your friends. I think that religion should follow the same rules as everyone else. The burden of proof. If yes. you're going to say a story, the burden of proof relies on you to make sure it's true. Because, you know, why not? If it's true, it's true. It's as simple as that. Yep. All right. So what other, do you have another piece of yeah. news uh, well, we should talk about? Sure. So um, this is kind of a ties into sort of this idea of fake news. But I want to talk for a few minutes about critical thinking and the lack of scientific literacy that's apparently plaguing not only our uh, voters, but also uh, our politicians, which is very concerning to me. And I want to bring to attention two news stories that came out over the last uh, couple of days. Well, one came out, I think, a week ago. The first one is, now, keep this in mind, the uh, U.S. House Committee on Science and Technology uh, Tweet, they have a Twitter account, because everybody's got a Twitter account these days. Apparently, Twitter's what you need to be president. To, to spread uh, your ideology and have people believe you. Apparently, Twitter, 140 characters is what requires, is what people to make an pay argument. attention to. I guess we've gone so ADD in this country that you can't read anything past 140 characters. But anyway, so they tweeted out a link to a debunked Breitbart news, talking about fake news. Fake news, there. Breitbart report that came out that global warming um, is not happening and it's fake climate changes and they try to explain it as it's an El Nino or El Nina issue and not really part of a broader um, climate change idea so what they um, you know the the, the report um, uh, is written by a, a climate change denier called uh, James Dellingpole and here's what he says in this report he says thanks to what's now uh, recognized as an unusually strong El Nino Global temperatures were driven to sufficiently high levels to revive the alarmist narrative, alarmist meaning the climate change narrative, uh, after an unhelpful pause period of nearly 20 years. In other words, he's trying to say that there was no... No increase, uh, except no increase. for the last 10 yeah. years. Um, yeah. That the world had gotten hotter than ever before. So this is what he's saying. And the committee on science in the House retweeted this. Now, NASA has done its own study. Uh, and they've been National doing Science studies. Foundation has done their own studies. And, you know, they uh, have um, debunked that. And they do explain the El Nino and El Nino phenomena in a broader context of climate change, which is important. But just like you have um, Representative Inhofe that goes in the middle of the House floor and throws a snowball and says, what well, global warming as evidence, this is no different than that. It's short-sighted, it is scientifically illiterate, and it's quite ignorant, and it's pretty embarrassing that our uh, politicians are tweeting this stuff out. But it's effective. It works. So Apparently so. It works because of this lack of critical thinking skills. I have friends that are professors and their number one complaint is that they're receiving all these students coming in who don't, do not know how to think. Who, they, right. who, who absolutely uh, spend the first year of college just trying to formulate ideas and trying to put things in order. So we have to, the, part of the problem here is an so, educational problem so, which some are trying to well, you know, stop. it's trying to stop, but here's going along those lines. The second piece of news that I want to bring up is Trump's choice for Secretary of Education. He picked an individual by the name of Betsy Davos. Now, if you guys don't know who Betsy Davos is, well, her and her husband have spent millions of dollars in lobbying 
uh, in Michigan to change the, the public education system to privatize it. And they're big charter school promoters. And they have succeeded in um, privatizing, especially schools in Detroit, uh, all over Michigan. Now, the problem is every educator on both sides of the aisle, a political spectrum, have said that this system has failed, especially our Detroit children. And here you are, a person who wants to indoctrinate. Basically, charter schools are indoctrination centers that are private, that are, and, and they're protected under our First Amendment free speech. So imagine, can teach you can they teach want. whatever they want to anything. And now they want taxpayers to subsidize these schools which so are that often anybody, religious. which often are often religious, religious, so that anybody can uh, send their kids to these schools. Unbelievable. I mean, well, they are trying know, to destroy public education because keeping people ignorant make them easier to well, manipulate. What's interesting is that, uh, well, she's one of the many millionaires and billionaires yep. that are joining the club over there in Washington. But yeah, what draining of the swamp, right? It's getting uh, even filling more. Of the swamp. Yeah, it's filling of the swamp is what it is. But the, the, the interesting thing is that none of her kids has ever gone to public school. Mm. And so uh, when they criticize and say, hey, this is what's going on, rather than fixing the problem, <laughs> they figured, hey, this is a good way to start whatever yep. systems. Now, their idea in a lot, with a lot of politicians is that they want to put in every state to control schools at every level yep. no sets of standards so we'll have what we we already have which is this is no way of improving it's just going to make it worse where poor states are going to have worse education where you're going to have uh, uh, perhaps entire states that are not yep. going to have anything uh, no uh, no standards they're not going to learn certain things they're going to learn about evolution or what we need in this country is another Sputnik moment because that was when a federal government got involved in the 1950s and mandated science standards in order to help students educate themselves to become scientists and engineers and in the STEM sciences. Now we got one minute left and yep. uh, we'll end so, up there, but let's uh, move forward. And, well, and so we'll we do the person, uh, guess who the person of the week is this week? I don't know who could that be, right? Uh, it is Dr. Thomas Doyle. Person of the week, and what I'm going to do is because I don't want to screw it up, I'm going to read just some of his uh, honors that he has received. First of all, Dr. Dole was one of the first people in the Catholic Church ever to bring attention to the sexual abuse clergy back in the in the 80s, uh, and uh, he authored a, a report on medical and legal issues raised uh, by pedophilia in the priesthood, and he quote warned of a national scandal if the hierarchy did not adopt a sound policy. Yeah. And it became more like a prophecy. So the, when the uh, voice of the faithful honor Dr. Doyle uh, with the first priest of integrity award in 2002, uh, Dr. Uh, David uh, Clohesy, director of the National Survivors Network, uh, those abused by priests, called him an absolute hero. And it is one of, and I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, in recognition for his advocacy work for victims of clerical sexual abuse, he also received the Cavallo Award of Moral Courage in 1992, the Isaac Hecker Award uh, from the Paulist Fathers in 2003, and uh, in June of 2003, uh, Dr. Doyle was also issued an official commendation from the Dominican Fathers for his prophetic work on drawing attention uh, in the clergy. So, got to wrap it up because we got to go on break, but we'll be right back we'll with be Father right Doyle. Back. I could have gone for hours, but he's got a lot of accolades. On a break. <laughs> One of the goals of an atheist community is to provide support for those who find themselves without faith in light of mounting evidence against unfounded beliefs. Organizations with this goal range from skeptic groups to humanist service meetups to support groups for those who may have lost a community through their deconversion. In response to this, Recovering from Religion, an organization that seeks to support those who have left their faith, has recently launched the Hotline Project. This is not a deconversion hotline. The motive behind the project is to support a growing population of people who have left their faith and need to construct their identities around a new, beautiful reality. If you want more information, you can visit the Recovering from Religion website at recoveringfromreligion.org.
some glue. Homemade noodles. Oh. Marty, stop it. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. It reminds me. I've been thinking, uh, maybe we should try a new form of birth control. I heard about this one, it's called the IUD, intrauterine device. Or we could try the patch on your arm. Actually, I think that one goes on your butt. Bedsider.org has birth control information and a lot more. And it's... What do you think, though? Arm of the butt. There's a lot of tree branches and dry brush over here. We should probably move the bonfire over there. I'm guessing Smokey liked that idea. This is Richard Dawkins. Doing commercials is unfamiliar territory for me, but I'm inviting you to watch Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century, on Fairfax Public Access every Sunday. Each week, the hosts tackle wishful thinking, religion, pseudoscience, and the harm they cause, with a combination of facts, humor, and community involvement. They challenge believers to defend their faith and give you, the skeptic, a voice. With live call-ins for viewers and streaming on the World Wide Web, there's never a dull moment. Don't wait. Look at them now on Facebook and YouTube. And remember to watch Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century, or there'll be hell to pay. <laughs> Welcome back uh, to Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century. Uh, I want to do a real quick uh, intro, but I want to read it because I don't want to screw it up. There's just so much stuff in here. But uh, uh, as I mentioned before, we're going to be, we have the great honor and pleasure to have uh, Dr. Thomas Doyle, a Dominican priest with a doctorate in canon law and five separate master's degrees. He sacrificed, he sacrificed his career at the Vatican Embassy to become an outspoken advocate for the church abuse victims. And since 1984, when he became involved with the issue of sexual abuse of children uh, by Catholic clergy while working at the Vatican Embassy, he has become an expert in the canonical and pastoral dimensions of this problem. Uh, he, work, he has worked directly with victims, their families, accused priests, bishops, and other high-ranking church officials. And he has interviewed over 2,000 victims of clerical sexual abuse in the U.S. alone. Uh, he has been the only priest to testify in over 200 cases as the legal liability, for the legal, uh, as the legal liability of the church. And he has developed policies and procedures for dealing with cases of sexual abuse by the clergy uh, for diocese and religious orders in the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, as an expert in this area, he has delivered lectures, seminars for clergy and lay groups throughout uh, the U.S. And he even appeared uh, uh, as an expert witness uh, before the legislature uh, on the, for the state of uh, Pennsylvania. And one last thing, he also spent uh, a few days, uh, many, many years, uh, he was an Air Force major mm -hmm. uh, stationed in Germany who also served as a military chaplain in Iraq, and he holds 16 military awards and decorations for distinguished service. He currently serves as a consultant to the courts, uh, a, an expert in clerical abuse uh, cases throughout the United States, Canada, Israel, Ireland, and the United Kingdom. Uh, so. Dr. Doyle, welcome to our welcome. show. Thank I could you. have gone again more and more, but... Uh, <laughs> you have had a very busy life. It sounds like a eulogy, so that's... <laughs> <laughs> that's good that it isn't, right? Uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> well, you, you have been doing this for, for a little while. And uh, how do you... Bef before, before we get in, in, into it, why don't you give us a little bit of how you got into this? How is it that you became to defend sexual abuse of victims? Maybe, you know, if we get a basis on, on, sure. on that, we I can guess go you that. start with the Catholic Church and then... The, yeah. the, the, the capsulized version. Yeah. <clears throat> In 1983 and 84, I was uh, an active priest, and I was working in the Vatican Embassy here in Washington, D.C. And uh, at that time, uh, the issue of sexual abuse of children, minors, vulnerable adults by Catholic clergy, it simply was not on the horizon. It wasn't on the grid. Uh, it wasn't something anybody talked about. I'd say most people simply didn't believe it existed. Right. But it was very much there. Uh, a case came to the surface in Louisiana of a priest who had violated uh, 
At that time we thought a lot, at least about 40 children. And the, the Catholic diocese down there attempted to um, enter into uh, confidentiality agreements with nine families. Mm. Uh, and they paid each family a, a six-figure uh, wow. award, whatever you want to call it. Hush money, I call it. Hush money. Hush money. Well, yeah, well, it, yeah, call, it, I'm trying to, call it what it is. I mean, it was yeah. hush money. Um, one of the families pulled out, and they obtained the services of an attorney, and that changed everything because he filed a suit in civil court against the diocese because this priest had been known since before he was ordained, 12 years prior to that, and had simply been moved from one place to another. Yeah. And it all came to a head uh, that the, they finally had to do something about it when, when one uh, furious father actually threatened to kill a pastor of a parish wow. if they didn't do something. Mm. That got their attention. Yep. So once the, the uh, lawsuit was filed in the civil court, the district attorney had to file criminal charges because all a bunch of these cases were still within the statute of limitations. Sure. They were still little kids at the yep. time. That, of course, the media got a hold of that, and then it was all over the place. Now, why wasn't the district attorney filing anything at that point until, until a, civil, a civil suit came out? Because he didn't know about it. Oh, I see. I see. It had been hidden. Suit, didn't see, it? this had been hidden. Ah, I see. It, was, I see. it had been buried. And so when the civil suit was filed... Now it's public. And this one family pulled out, and, and you know, then he saw the civil suit and realized that these kids are still within statute of limitations, so I've right. got to file criminal charge, which he did. Right. Publicity went all over the place, and I thought naively that uh, once the, the Catholic bishops realized how serious and horrific this is, they'd all snap to and do the right thing. Which would have been what at that time? Which would have been first reach out to the families and the victims and do whatever you can to take care of them, get this guy off the grid immediately, sure. you know, and find out where the other, if there's any more victims out there and any priests that you know of that have been doing this, you pull them offline and, and, and put them on ice somewhere. Mm -hmm. Well, well I didn't. The authorities. Yeah, what happened was I didn't know how widespread it was. I was just, this was 33 years ago. And it turns out once the publicity started, all of a sudden a lot of cases were coming out of the woodwork. And what was actually happening was children who had gone home and said things to their parents were now being believed. Parents say, hey, maybe he's right. Yeah. Or kids who were punished for saying something bad about a priest, parents felt bad, and now they said, woo, you know. We, maybe there is something to maybe this. Maybe there yeah. is something to this. And then there were others there were parents who had believed their children and had reported it and gotten, you know, thrown out, you know, stonewalled, stiff-armed by the church. Right. They came back, went public. And so then it became a public problem. Uh, so what was, what was particularly your job in, in there? Were you supposed to protect the church? Initially, that was part of it. All I was doing was, was keeping a file. I was doing the administrative part of it. I see. But what I was, I was being a bit proactive because I got two other people involved, one other man involved, who was a priest but also a psychiatrist who specialized in helping priests with psychosexual problems. Mm -hmm. He knew where the bodies were buried. He knew this had been a problem. And then the other, the third man, a guy named Ray Mouton, who was actually a civil attorney from Louisiana, who the church had hired to represent this priest in the criminal charges. So his own lawyer came up to Washington to see me because he knew the position I had. Mm. And he said, I need to talk to you. He said, because the bishop down there knows that there's at least eight or nine others like this guy, Gote, was the priest name, Gilbert Gote. They're out there, and he's doing nothing about them. And he said, I, he said there's something wrong with this. Right. And he turned out to be... And this was Ray Mouton that came Ray to you Mouton to, to tell you about yes. this. So we teamed up, the three of us, and decided we'd try to do something to help the church and help the bishops and thinking they would welcome this. Right, because he was thinking they wanted yeah. to do the right thing. So. Some, some of the ones I talked to, and I saw them, and I was in contact with them all the time, were willing, they wanted help. This is something they hadn't encountered yet. But I didn't realize that there was a, a, a big, uh, in, the, in the whole system, there was a significant number. They knew what the score was. And what they did not want to happen was to have this publicized so that it would do, uh, it would bring, um, 
discredit on the institution, namely the bishops. See, yeah. And so I, I began to see that the hierarchy of values was really upside down from where it should right. have been. The first concern should have been these kids and their parents. And the last concern should have been the image of the Catholic Church. Right. And by the Catholic Church, they meant themselves, the bishops. The Catholic Church really was these kids and their parents. So I didn't really know what to do. I did what I thought was the right thing, and I kept plugging away uh, with these other two guys, trying to get attention to the problem and get somebody to do something about it, not realizing that as I was doing this, I was really rubbing, my, rubbing them the wrong way, and I was gaining a lot of... Uh, um, well, enemies? I was, uh, enemies, yeah, enemies, yeah, I was, yeah. enemies yeah. because they, the last thing they wanted was this thing to get out into the public. Right. Yeah. But it all changed drastically when I met, for the first time, one of the young victims. Then it no longer, for me, was, it was a problem for me before that. But the victims and their families were pieces of paper. They were names on pieces of paper. Right. Then I met this, this family, and I met this little 10 year, 11 year old boy. And I'll never forget that encounter, and that changed everything. Now it was a human problem, and I, I could not f possibly go along with any kind of a cover-up that would hurt other kids like that. The, the funny thing is that, you know, for those people that are religious, the question should be, what would Jesus do in this situation? And I think you did. Jesus more. didn't even enter into the equation. Yeah. I Humanity mean, the, the problem was, you know, what, we have to take yeah. care of the church. And what, over the years, I've been involved in this problem now since then, yes. steadily. One thing I have noticed in my involvement, not throughout the United States and in a number of other countries, has been the almost total lack of concern on the part of the hierarchy for the victims. Right. By that I mean when a bishop gets the word that Father so-and-so violated a kid, his first concern usually is getting his lawyer, protecting themselves, getting a hold of the priest. And I've never seen a case, and I've been involved not just 200, closer to 2,000 right. uh, of these, I've never seen a case where the bishop's first reaction was to call the family and say, I'm the bishop, I'm on the way over to see whatever you need to take care of you. That's never happened. Not only in wow. the U.S., but anywhere else that I've been. And I wonder if he, if he did, would, uh, how would the rest of the church see that as? If they did that, the church would say, he's doing the right thing, you know. He'd be, that's what it's supposed to be, not just a bunch of buildings and an institution. But is that, so, is that what the Vatican would like to see? Yeah, so do you, do you think no. this was uh, on the, the problem with how these priests were kind of shuffled back and forth? Um, do, you, do you think it was the bishops that sort of, you know, created uh, the environment, or do you think there was actually something, um, you know, a top-down hierarchy that directed them to protect the church, the church first and then worry about the families? They didn't need to write a policy that said protect the church sure. first and then protect the family. It was deeply, deeply embedded in the culture, in the, right. okay. in the church culture. The way the bishops were the raised, the way priests were enculturated, the way we were informed. Mm. The most important thing was the welfare of the church. But but the church was the institution. Right. What you saw, the, the, the governmental system. And the people, they were like the serfs, you know. It yeah, was, the it flock was, is, uh, yeah, it not, was not a, important. A monarchical, it's a mm -hmm. monarchical political structure mm -hmm. with uh, an aristocracy, maybe two or three layers of aristocracy, and then this huge mass of the lay people. And that actually is not just a facetious saying by myself. That's the doctrine. That's the yes. way it's laid out. Uh, there was a pope in, called Pius X, and in 1908 he wrote an encyclical, which is one of these big letters that goes all over the world to everybody. Yes. Mm -hmm. And in that he explicitly said, there are two layers in the church, or the two, two, two groups of people, the pastors or the bishops and the lay people. And the lay people's duty is to be docilely led by the pastors and do whatever they say. Which I Absolutely. looked at that when I read that I said this says it all and this is not the church. I think I remember I hearing that in catechism. <laughs> yeah, I mean exactly, uh, but that's exactly yeah, that's crazy. So what 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 do you think is the percent? So let's not throw everybody under the bus. What percentage of priests would you guess or would you think uh, are having this problem? And is the Catholic Church unique in this sense 
Do they have a higher number of pedophiles than, than other general churches? Public, or, yeah, or general, general public, yeah. Let, let me, if I may, just clarify one thing. I've, sure. I've gotten so, I guess, attuned to all the, the nuances of this issue. It originally was referred to as a pedophile problem because the first priest that we came upon, this priest in Louisiana, was a true pedophile. By that I mean his victims were all prepubescent boys, little mm -hmm. boys. Now, you, you can well imagine the horror of a, an adult male having anal sex with a four, five, six-year-old boy. Jeez. Um, so that's, those, he was a true pedophile. Most of the sexual abuse of minors is not pedophilia, it's, it's priests or clergy preying upon young adolescent boys, 12, 13, 14, something like that. It's still devastating, it's still damaging. It's still uh, illegal. Just as, it's still illegal. Sure, it's statutory rape. The only it's still rape. The only difference is the, it's the age, that's all. Yeah. Um, so, that's uh, a good clarification to the, make. Uh, yeah. the, Various experts that are looking at different populations to try to find out what percentage fall in this group of males or females that are sexually attracted and act out with, with minors, children and minors. Mm -hmm. In the Catholic Church, uh, one expert named Richard Seip, who uh, did a 20-some year study involving, I think, interviews with about 2,000 priests, his estimate was about at any time between five and six percent of the Catholic population. And that seems to be proven true uh, with other studies that have been done in other Catholic church population and in other subpopulations, right. um, yeah. lawyers, ministers, and so on. The difficulty with playing around with those numbers is in, in any, in the Catholic church especially, it's divided up into uh, geographic entities called dioceses. Right. Mm -hmm. And in any one, at any given period, the percentage can vary. So I've seen places where at least 50% of the priests were known to have violated kids. And in others were as low as... Because they also move them around. Well, so they move yeah. them around. So the, the, <coughs> the issue across the board, I think, I'd say five to six or, or five to six percent is maybe a conservative number, because the uh, it's statistically proven that only about thirty-five to thirty-seven percent of people who are sexually violated as minors ever come forward. Right. Ever. Uh, boys or girls. Boys, boys or girls. Or girls. Boys yes. or girls. The boys, same. The same. Yes. The same. And far fewer in 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 heavily religious env environments. So. Fewer Catholics will come forward because of the fear factor, because of the guilt factor that's built into them. Because most of these victims are from devout Catholic families. Yes. You know, Father isn't going to get his hands on, on, on Joe Schmo, who's an ex-Catholic and now a practicing, practicing atheist. You know, he's not sending his kid to school. Right. Uh, so the fact is, most of these kids are from very devout families, and they've gone through all the indoctrination, all the brainwashing, everything else. Uh, well, and that's part of it, I think, but also um, uh, abuse victims in general tend to be quiet about their abuse uh, for a very long time. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, they just don't want to talk about it for many reasons, and some of them is they don't want to relive it, they don't want yeah. to, you know, uh, they're afraid of the, the abuser for, for a number of reasons. But there's also within the Catholic Church, obviously, there's also a uh, very deep ingrained you know, ideology and culture that, you know, you don't mess with the church. Yeah. You don't, uh, you don't. You must have provoked yeah. them. You yeah, it's your, it, well, it's, everything it's, you're saying is yeah. true. Uh, the average age of abuse across the board, not just Catholic kids, is 12. The average age of uh, uh, disclosure for those who do disclose is around 40. Right. So you generally have a 20 to 30 year period there. And you mentioned the, the key factors, guilt, shame, fear. Which is what the Catholic doctrine really is. I mean, Christianity yeah. is based off this idea of guilt and, you know, mia culpa. Yeah, I've met more victims than I can count. Yeah. And, and a, a, com a very common, there's several common threads. One is uh, the priest represents God. Mm -hmm. Priests can't do sin. They don't right. sin. So God's mm -hmm. doing this to me. What did I do wrong to have God exactly. punishing me? Now, that's, that's called magical thinking. It's very toxic thinking. Yes. A second one is, um, I must have provoked him. 
because priests don't, they can't do sex. So they must have lost his control and it must be my fault. Right. Now those thoughts are put into the heads of these children by the church itself, by the teaching. Mm -hmm. May not, maybe not directly, but they somehow come to that conclusion. Right. And that's toxic in itself. So that's, it, it would appear that the church in and of itself has created the perfect environment for um, predators and victims to be not only together in close proximity, but ideologically it created an environment where the victims never spoke out because um, of, of the ideology that they've been, uh, you know, maybe not on purpose, but just as a, as a the nature of uh, uh, Catholic doctrine, you just uh, never spoke out. It, it is a well, everything you're saying is yeah. true. It, it's almost a, like a perfect storm scenario mm -hmm. yeah. where uh, the victims are innocent, they're, they're uh, groomed, they're drawn into this web by the priest, and they're totally unsuspecting because unlike any other adult male in the community, he's the only one the parents are going to allow to take their underage children away on weekends, take them to the beach, go up to their bedroom when you're visiting and tuck them into bed, say goodnight to them. Uh, you, if the mailman comes and says, can I take your 12-year-old son for, away for a weekend? You know, even back in 1940, they say, you nuts. Look at it. So do it, you think the celibacy has anything to do with it? I know some people say off the cuff, oh, it's because of that celibacy rule Re that they have. Repressed sexuality. This, yeah. It does have something to do, but not in the way most people believe. Mm -hmm. uh, celibacy is, I think, a, a very unnatural uh, situation. Right. Mm -hmm. If a man chooses to be celibate and is able to do that, fine. But for most priests, it's something we accepted, not really thinking it through fully and thinking that, you know, we'd be able to handle this. So you're forced to be celibate to be a Catholic priest. Right. And in many ways, you're put into a situation where you're going to have to be dishonest to some extent. Well, so, but there are a lot of priests that are married with kids that came from uh, Anglican Church or yes. Lutherans or something like that, yeah. and they're okay to operate. And they're, what is the logic behind the celibacy in that the church has to the, tell people don't? You, you want know? the true logic or the false? Both. Both. Okay. Yeah. The, 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 the propaganda, the teaching is that, uh, first off, that sexuality, human sexuality, is basically not good. Right, no, yeah, okay. that's it's basically ingrained. bad. And yeah. we will tolerate it to make more human, more little Catholics. <laughs> one, one, one good analogy is there's two kinds of sex in the Catholic Church. First, there's the kind that only married people can do with the lights out in one position only, trying to enjoy as little as possible to make little Catholics. That's one. <laughs> two is everything else, which is a mortal which sin, and gets you a life sentence in hell. <laughs> but back on track, the celibacy issue, a celibate... A priest who is uh, refrains from sexual relations, let's say, is not automatically going to be attracted to kids. That's a sexual disorder, whether it's pedophilia or, se or sexually attracted to young adolescents. If I'm a 40-year-old male and I'm sexually attracted to 12, 13-year-old girls, there's something wrong with that picture. Now, in the Catholic Church, the celibacy thing plays into it kind of indirectly because it plays into it because of the environment that the church has created in its seminaries and in its cultural sub or its uh, clerical subculture to justify celibacy so you have the old seminary system where there were no women right uh, you 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 would intimacy was something you didn't talk about that was not good sex was certainly you know the only sex instruction these young kids ever got then when they went to the seminary after eighth grade was it's a mortal sin which is like a capital crime right so you had all of that and you're living in this environment where intimacy is wrong sex is wrong and it's something that you can turn off and so you begin to if you are raised in an environment like that through your high school years, your college years, you're not going to mature. Your body's right. going to get older, but your emotions right. and your sexuality is going to stay, stay at the age of 12 or 13 or 14. Yeah. So as one psychologist said one time, he said, I can easily explain why Father X, who is 39 years old, had two or three relationships with 12-year-old boys because they were both the same age. You know. uh, the, there are a couple wow. of questions yeah, I want to ask you from, P I, I, 
in the internet, uh, I ask people to send questions. Sure. And so I want to make sure, this one is from Lia Lopez. Uh, she's a devout, very devout Catholic. Um, quote, uh, do you still consider yourself a Catholic? Are you still a priest? Do you consider Pope Francis the legitimate successor of Peter and the vicar of Christ on earth? We'll start with the last one. Uh, pope Francis is the Pope. I'm not sure if I believe in the the issue of a vicar of Christ on earth. Vicar of Christ means he represents Jesus Christ on right. earth. Uh, that's just a title that they cooked up in the early Middle Ages to add more power and strength to the papacy. Uh, I'm not even sure if he uses that title. And it's very reminiscent of uh, old uh, ancient uh, well, it's, religions. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's like, it's, I am the king. Yeah. The gods made me king, therefore I am like a god. Exactly. It's exactly. the same exact uh, type of mentality. This is the 21st century. It's kind of counterproductive to create that sort of magical thinking. That whatever the Pope says, that's the word of God, if you believe in that kind of a god. Which you is know. funny because Pope Francis has said some things that are very progressive and liberal. And it's funny because if his word is the final word because he represents God, why does the Catholic Church always have to send a spokesperson to clarify what the Pope meant? Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the generally, mo a lot of people can figure out yeah. what they what they say, but if you're coming up with a with a with a um, an explanation of what he said, that's sort of backward and negative, and you say that, then they'll they'll immediately say, well, you know, people don't rightly understand it. No, they mm -hmm. do understand. Yeah, it. they do. Very They're rejecting well. it. Right. That's the problem. They're exactly. rejecting it as nonsense. So I have. Uh, different feelings toward this pope. Uh, I, I don't really have a dog in that fight because I'm not a member of the Catholic Church. Right. Um, so, so that answers you. You're still not a yeah. priest. So. Well, I I was ordained and I'll always legally be a priest, but I'm not an active priest. I'm I don't even I don't like to use the word ex priest because I don't like all those titles. I'm a non-active priest. I'm not in it anymore. Yeah. Are you? Um, were you ever excommunicated officially from the Catholic Church? No, I was never excommunicated or defrocked. Or any of that business. Mm -hmm. uh, one bishop threatened to excommunicate me uh, because of uh, my activity with this, and because I've stood up publicly and criticized them and testified right. in court against them. And my response was, do whatever you have to do. I don't exactly. care. It doesn't mean a thing to me. If you think it's going to quiet me down, you think again. We well, backed off because that's a, that's a, a, a piece of ammunition that for many of us, myself included, means nothing anymore. Right, and, and it's an empty threat, first of all, but yeah. secondly, um, it would make them look even worse if they're trying to silence and kick out those who are um, trying to defend the victims. And yeah. in public, that's a PR nightmare for them. So, it would be a yeah. PR nightmare. Because, and you're not drawing the salaries. So it's not like it's going to happen. Right. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, it's, well, yeah, it's, it's an empty threat. Like, it's a non issue for me. Yeah. You know, I've, okay. been threatened with a lot of, I've been accused of being a dissenter, a heretic, of this, that, and the other. And I say, fine. Nazi also. I, heard, I saw somewhere no. someone accused you of being a Nazi. Nazi, <laughs> yeah. communist, yeah, but I don't, I don't know. But you know, th this is violation of children yes. by adults, and it's being covered up, has been covered up, by the leaders, not just of any organization, but of a cat, the church, the largest religion on earth, mm -hmm. and the oldest Christian religion. That has nothing to do with dogma, with 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 belief systems, with heresy, with orthodoxy, with any of that. It's behavior. Criminal behavior. Right. So that, that has another qu related question to that is from Julia, and uh, she's also a Catholic, and she says, as far as I know, the Catholic Church now has the victim's welfare above anything. Do you have any evidence to the contrary, or do, do you disagree? I do disagree. They, they, uh, first off, the Catholic Church is a very broad term. The institutional churches speak a lot about taking care of the victims, but in fact, they want to do it on their terms. And also, in fact, what this means is to try to recover some of the, the, the PR disasters right, that have happened over the years. And I see on a regular basis, up close and personal, just how much concern there is. There's concern, but it has to be on their terms. They'll do the right it's, thing after they've tried everything else. It's misplaced uh, when, when priorities. Yeah. When victims, for example, go to court, which is the only way they'll get any sort of justice in the civil courts, they're hammered into the ground by the church's lawyers. Now, the church's lawyers are hired by the church. Sure. And they do some horrific things to some of these victims. So I don't think it's true. They talk a lot about it. If they really had the victims uppermost in mind as the top of the priority list, I wouldn't have to be 
doing what I'm doing. Doing what you're doing, exactly. And, that, that and you, would see, you would see the first response when a victim reports, whether they're older, whether it happened years ago or recently, the very first response would be immediately somebody from the leadership would go there without his press secretary with him, without photographers, but would go to that person's home and sit down and say, just, I'm just going to listen. If you're angry, I'll absorb your anger. If you're sad, whatever, I'm here to listen and to help. That well, does not happen. No, it period. Doesn't. And I mean, and, and the thing is that if if the Catholic Church wanted to put the victims first, why did they wait until now? Anyway, I mean, this has been going on for how long? Uh, probably thousands. Well, of years. I, I well, mentioned I wrote a book. Two other guys and I wrote a book uh, that came out in 2006, and it is the documentary history of sexual abuse by clergy in the Roman Catholic Church. Right. Now, I've continued to do research. My research now has led me back to the first century. The documentation wow. says it existed. But at the time of the book, it was the fourth century. Is it called Sex, Priests, and Secret Codes? Sex, Priests, and Secret Codes. There we go. <laughs> and that, that it's, in, it's, it's the documents itself from the church's own archives. Mm -hmm. And uh, wow. so we've got... So one uh, more question from another viewer. Uh, his name is Nelson Ricard. He says, I think you answered this one partly already, but uh, why does it seem there is more sexual abuse towards boys than girls? And also, when men become priests, are they perhaps already broken and looking for the chastity vows as a solution for their mental issues? That may be the case with some. I, I can't speak to that because uh, I really don't know. I think a lot of men, when they went in the seminary uh, to become priests, at least in my era when I did, went in with, the good, with good intentions. When I went in in the 60s, it was an honorable profession. Mm -hmm. my, my role models were good, decent men. I admired them. I respected them. And a lot of the men I, I, I was, that were my professors, my teachers, my leaders, mentors, were decent, good guys. Um, so. I don't think it's fair to say that now, what's going in now is another thing, because I've seen a whole generation of these young priests coming out that are terrifying. Oh, they're wow. ultra conservative, they're ultra traditional, yeah. they're, they're about as deep as a layer of shellac as far as their critical thinking and theological knowledge is right. concerned. Very judgmental. And it's all the, the, the appearances, it's all the trappings. Uh, and, is and, it and what, priest? Yeah, and, and, <laughs> yeah. and what, bring, what comes to mind when you say that is uh, uh, Donahue from the Catholic League is sort of someone that I would think is very conservative, very just um, shallow, non-critical thinking type of uh, person. And, and, you know, the, and speaking of him, you know, what bothered me the most when he was trying to defend the pedophilia and the sex scandal uh, in the Catholic Church, he tried to blame it on homosexuality as that being the problem. And that kind of leads into, you know, when they asked about the, um, you know, why are more boys being molested than girls? Well, I think, I would assume, maybe incorrectly, but it's because the priests have more access to boys than girls within the Catholic community, uh, in, at least in the, uh, in the priesthood. I don't think there's a definitive, scientifically proven answer to that okay. question, but I can say this, that uh, there's more sexual abuse by non-married men, mo the non-married men generally have, their higher percentage have male victims. Hmm. A lot of priests have female victims. A smaller percentage, it's a minority, are, are young, young adolescent girls, but they are there. Uh, it's not a homosexual problem any more right. than adultery is a heterosexual exactly. problem. Exactly, that's the... So when yeah. these people like Donahue make these statements, they're brainless. Yes, you know, and they're, they're, they come out of a, uh, I think, of an ignorant, deep-seated prejudice against gay people. This is, this is where we are today. You know, yes. uh, it's not just that it's not politically correct to be be homophobic; it's it's ridiculous. Right. So, if you, and we're, you know, quickly ran out of time and so much to talk about, but <laughs> uh, if you were the Pope, what would you do different than what Francis has been doing? Uh, what would you change? What, what would be uh, the way to solve these problems? Don't say disintegrate the church because that well, would be Well, I think, I, you know, he's trying to do a lot of things. <laughs> and he's, 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 he's up against the Vatican Curia, which has been there. I mean, that's a... That's he's a not, he doesn't have the absolute power that most people think no, he, he has. No, he doesn't have the power people think. I think, <laughs> you know, probably getting rid of a lot of the top-level guys over there. Cleaning house. Cleaning house. And, and probably clean, not easy to do. And, 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 yeah, not easy to do. Do you need this kind of a bureaucracy? Uh, do you need all this to have 
the Roman Catholic Church, all this centralization. You need a monarchy to have a, a real, you know, a true religion, which is a spiritual movement, you know, a way to find a better life through a higher power. Do you need all this stuff? Uh, or, or don't you? Maybe you don't. So uh, you're saying that the Francis is really, his hands are pretty tight? They're not totally tied, but they're, they're hobbled to some extent because right. I've known some people on the inside that talk about the changes he's trying to do and some of, the, some of the barriers he has to overcome to get them done. Because you're dealing with a bureaucracy over there that's centuries old. And yes, these, exactly. not even, not even, you know, if God himself, if there was a God, came down and got in that mess, he wouldn't even be able to sort it out. <laughs> because it's so wow. convoluted and, and, and there are so many different strands of, of different agendas and different power plays going on. Um, do, do you think that Pope Francis is honestly trying to make things better or do you think he's uh, still playing along a PR type of uh, function um, or, or at least uh, rhetoric. I think he's trying to make things better because he's got a lot of guys against him, a lot of the top level. I mean, he's getting yeah, a lot of pushback. That's a good sign then. That's one way yeah. to know whether you're moving he, in the right he's direction. Getting a, you're some enemies, significant yeah. pushback from some of the cardinals right. uh, yeah. and some of the top level because of, he wants to do things, for example, uh, he wants to open up the church to divorced and remarried people because they right. had yeah. this centuries long prejudice against them yeah. and, and open it up. And I, you know, if you believe, just let's say you look at Catholicism or Christianity when the Christ said, I love everybody, everybody's welcome. And you look at some of the Catholic document and it says, Christ says he loves everybody and everybody's welcome, except these guys, the right. divorced, the, the gays, the transsexuals, the this. You're not welcome. Stay out. Instead, you change, unless you change and become like we want you to be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is, is craziness. Well, that's, again, the conditions of uh, Jesus' love in the Catholic yeah. Church and other, other Christian churches, not just uh, Catholicism, um, is conditional. Well, One of the easiest ways to lose what they call lose faith and when I started losing something, I realized I was losing faith in the system, yes. in the organization, because everything they're saying is very hard for me to believe anymore, have faith in, when I see the opposite going on with the most innocent people on earth, the little kids. Right. The ones so that are supposed to. The ones that are supposed to. Right. So you say, well, what are you losing faith in? I'm not sure. I'm losing faith in this organization, that's for sure. So, that's for sure. And, and the kind of God they appeal to, to support all their, their crazy thinking. Uh, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, I've always thought that Pope Francis was selected as the Pope because uh, the Catholic Church was bleeding uh, members in Latin America, which for centuries had been a safe yeah. haven for Catholicism. And, and so, and I think he's done really good at that, at sort of retaining a lot of those Catholics. But as far as you know, is Latin America going to go through what the U.S. has gone over the last 20 years, where all these people are coming out, where all these uh, 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 kids are being found, all these priests are being found out, and, and sort of people, you know, becoming out to a light? It seems to me that in the U.S. has been, you know, it's come out a lot in documentaries and things like that, but I noticed that in Latin America doesn't seem to have done the same way, same in the Philippines and in other yes. typically Catholic it's, places. It's starting to happen. It's been happening in Latin America over the past maybe 10 years or so. Um, not as dramatically as, as up here, but it is happening, I know that for sure. I attend uh, meetings, gatherings of victims uh, from all over the world, and what I've been very heartened to see is the number of, of, of men and women from Latin America that are coming forward and assuming leadership positions. Uh, okay. I was at a conference in Berlin uh, a week ago, and there were some women there from Nicaragua. Hmm. And they were starting a victim support organization in yep. Nicaragua. Okay. Uh, I've seen it. I, I, I've got a very close friend who's from Chile, and he's a brilliant guy. He's well educated, very classy, and he's leading the, the charge down there. And what we're finding, what they are finding, is that in many instances, the legal system is supporting them. Good. Uh, they're finding support among the, the lawyers because underneath the veneer of Catholicism or religiosity, a lot of times the roots are about an inch that each inch Absolutely. deep, and that's it. You get something like yes. this, and they have a chance where socially they can break through from these chains of organized religion and right. still get 
maintain their, their position, is they'll there, do it. Is there something like a dad, some sort of network here in the United States for victims of specific uh, Catholic uh, child abuse victims? There, yeah, 30 year, years ago, 19, 1988, 89, uh, an organization called SNAP was started, SNAP. Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests, which now will open itself to anybody abused by a minister, it doesn't matter. And that's worldwide. Okay. And it gives the victims somewhere to go, somewhere to call. Um, they have a website. It's called Snap Network. Um, it's it's still a grassroots operation. But yep. what's amazing to me is we started this thing, you know, back in 1986, if you want to call it a movement, up against, here's a ragtag bunch of people with nothing. You know, we had no money. No, 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 not much of anything. No audience. No audience. Yeah, and right. we're up against the largest corporation exactly. in the world, this humongous yep. church. And the wealthiest. Over the, the, over the, the wealthiest. World. And over 30 some years, we've, we've moved light years yeah. for the welfare of victims, of the, of the vulnerable, of those who have no voice and now have a that voice. That is a fantastic. Um, we've, cardinals have been fired because of this. Okay. Priests have been put in prison. Uh, it's cost the Catholic Church in the United States over four billion dollars alone. Well, to me, the scary part is that they had four billion dollars to oh, pay that's out. peanuts. And, a lot more and, than that. and that's a drop in a bucket yeah. Yeah. if you compare their, rev, uh, you know, all their assets. Now, yeah. and, and a quick follow-up to that, um, if you don't mind. Now, we talk a lot about uh, supporting the uh, victims, and that's great, and that's needed, but. You know, if you think of it from a psychological perspective, oftentimes uh, priests uh, that are, as we discussed earlier, engaged in these activities, possibly probably have some sort of uh, psychological issue that need to be addressed. Is there any, do you know of any place where priests can go to to seek help if they're having uh, these sort of urges or, or anything yeah. like that? As a matter of fact, there are. There are uh, several uh, facilities in the United States, and there's one in Canada at least, that handle only priests with psychological problems, with substance abuse problems. They've been in existence for, for decades. Uh, so the, actually the, the, the hierarchy, the bishops, have thrown more money and resources into helping the priests than they ever did for the victims. Right. Uh, the priest, if you go f come forward and say, I've got this problem, you will get anything you need as far as psychological help, residential treatment. Aftercare, the whole nine yards, everything. So it seems like they started moving in the right direction. They sort of didn't follow. Through this is under the church. Just yeah. as the church is doing this, yeah. they, they're moving. That part is the is the right direction. But they but still take care of number one. Still, Parallel still to that one, is right? the victims. Absolutely. There is, the, they, the victims yep. in the Catholic Church are the most important single yes. part of the population because there's no office in the church, including the papacy, that is so important that it's worth sacrificing one child. Good. Yeah. Well, we got one less than a minute left. Um, I, I just wanted to then. one quick question, maybe yes or no, and is do, when you said all these priests joined the priesthood and that they they were truly believed in God and everything, had they ever never questioned why God, you know, has given them these feelings? You know, have any of them be, stopped being priests because of these feelings? A lot of them have. Yeah. A lot of them have. <laughs> Believe me, after the Second Vatican Council, I think that, you know. Tens of thousands have left, left because they had the feelings, and now socially they could leave. They right. wouldn't be they wouldn't be Seen failed that, men. Yeah. They wouldn't be, so. and so they have. And now, if you leave the priesthood, it's not no longer a disgrace. Well, you can leave. We're going to have to cut you off right there. This has been a great conversation. I want to so thank you for being, and I want to remind everybody to tune in next week. We've got Aaron Raw that will be here. Thank you very much, and have a good one.